Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an oceanographer, National Geographic explorer, founder of Mission Blue, and an ocean elder. Thank you, ocean elders, for sponsoring this program. Absolutely. And this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations on, with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. We're glad to be back and hope everyone has made time to get outdoors for fun, reflection, and gratitude instead of shopping on Black Friday. <laughs> um, as we get on in the program, you can put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get through as many of them as possible towards the end of the show. And before we get started, we want to remind everyone that the world is blue. Is oh, blue. Goodness. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Never forget. We are really excited today to have uh, Jeff Drazen from University of Hawaii joining us. Um, Sylvia and I had the pleasure of being at sea with Jeff on a Pisces submersible expedition some time ago, looking at deep water ecosystems. And Jeff specializes in the ecology of fishes and the in the uh, abyssal and baffle zones. And welcome, Jeff. It's good, so good to see you. Oh, thanks very much for inviting me. This is great. You're being photobombed by a lot of creatures, I see. Yeah, well, these these are a variety of deep midwater animals from uh, actually all around the globe. Uh, just a few of the strange and wonderful uh, diversity of life in, in the deep sea. That's awesome. And you're going to share, you're going to do the job of sharing slides today, right? You're going to share. I your will. I, I will start that now. Sweet. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so uh, I was going to talk a bit with you about my favorite subject, deep sea fishes, and uh, talk a bit about uh, what they are and what they look like and and bring that to us as humans and talk about our societal connections to the deep sea and these organisms and, and talk a little bit about some of the threats that our activities pose to these ecosystems. So what, what led uh, you to... to focus in on deep sea fishes well that's not terribly logical at all that is just, <laughs> you know, one of those things that grabs your attention uh i always liked fish and uh i i come from a family where lots of uh, folks uh fish just recreationally and uh and i had aquariums when i was young but deep sea fish specifically i got interested in this environment when i was in college i i knew nothing about the deep sea and i had a professor who wasn't was teaching invertebrate zoology for the first time and didn't really know what to do in the lab the first week but they had been a professor of bob hessler's at scripps institution of oceanography and had done some of their graduate work in hydrothermal vent systems and so the guy brought in a couple of buckets michelle boudria is the guy's name he brought in a couple of, of buckets of deep sea vent organisms Wow, and I was just amazed at these giant tube worms and clams and other things. And I think it was that semester or the next one when my biological oceanography uh, instructor, Sue Lowry, these, these people are at University of San Diego. She took us out on a boat for a day uh, and we towed a Tucker trawl uh, or an Isaac's Kid Midwater trawl down to four or 500 meters. And it came up and there was a dragon fish and a violet wow. lantern fish and a fang tooth. And, and I was just astonished that these organisms existed. I had never even heard about the deep sea before. And as I dug into it a little bit, I realized that this was really the last frontier on our planet. We knew so little about it. And that's when I decided this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to study these things. It's seductive. I read William Beebe's Half Mile Down when I was a kid. And his descriptions of these strange and wonderful creatures, fish with little lights down the side and big teeth, but they're only three inches long <laughs> and anyway, those mini monsters i think really sparked my imagination too along with the jellies and the little red shrimp and things that you don't really most people will never see and it's i think really important that you share the view so that people know what's out there down there under their boats under the surface of the ocean yeah. Yeah. It's most of the ocean. Right. And so it's it's a really important part of it. And uh, 
yeah, it's just fascinating. Uh, there's just so much strange diversity down there. It's 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 really wonderful. well adapted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at these these pictures just here on this opening spread. Um, I'll kind of show my cursor, but I don't know if you guys can see that right there, the cursor. But this yeah. is a tripod fish, and it's developed these super long fin rays to perch up above the seafloor. And then its pectoral fins are divided into these little individual rays, and those are armed with uh, sensors for smell and for vibration in the water column, and they just face into the current. They get propped up so they're where the current is a little stronger than it would be right on the seafloor. And they've got these this, these fins developed like a radar dish so that all the little plankton that comes down the current, they can sense that and they just snap it right out of the water column. That's so cool. It's just amazing. And yeah. their eyes are barely functional. So they, they've just developed other senses in the deep sea. This little fish here on the left, there's stories for all of these. I don't have to show them all. But uh, this fish on the left is called cyclothony. It's a little light fish. And this is the most abundant vertebrate on the planet. As a genus, there's, there's about a dozen species worldwide. And there are just tons of these fish uh, all over the place. And uh, most people don't even know what they are or have ever seen them. But uh, there, there are probably billions of these. On, on but the they, they must affect the chemistry of the ocean just through their existence. Through what they take in, what they process, yep, the the, okay. and the length yep. of time that they have been populating the ocean. I mean, long before we came along, <laughs> changing the chemistry of the ocean, <laughs> they're yeah. I don't know. They're I share with you the the desire for people to understand to really know the the magnitude of the importance of these fellow vertebrates that occupy the biggest living space on the planet. Indeed. Well, I'm going to move here to uh, the next slide. And yeah, there we are. are. Oh, that is. Huh. <laughs> exactly as you say. Yeah. <laughs> It is, and the deep sea is the biggest ecosystem on the planet. And this is a picture here of the abyssal plain off of central California, so not far to where you are, Sylvia, and where you are, Liz. And uh, you can see this rat tail fish right here. And it got its name because this long tapering tail looked to some early scientists a little bit like a rat's tail. Um, and uh, I sort of I think most people are aware that three quarters of the surface of, their of our planet, roughly 70% is covered by the oceans, but I think fewer people know that about 65% of the Earth's surface has water deeper than 200 meters, which is the yeah. of the deep ocean. This Below this depth, we don't yeah. have enough light for photosynthesis and for phytoplankton or plant growth. And so the deep ocean is about 85% of the living volume on our whole planet. It's enormous. And I love the the slide that you have here that just shows kind of that that great blue back of the Pacific. You know, it's just it's yeah. new that people don't really even usually look at. They they kind of turn it so they see more of the land mass. It but is planet ocean. Uh, yeah. I'm in those little yellow specks of islands in that Google Earth image uh, in the middle. That's uh, where you are. Are, are right <laughs> there in the middle, and uh, surrounded by the by the Pacific Ocean which is a marvelous place to work and study because I am surrounded by the environment that I, I work in. It's, it's marvelous being here at University of Hawaii. And I love that you get the, the, you know, you're really one of the scientists that really gets students out in the field. You know, there's this huge drive to kind of park them behind a computer and crunch data and look at numbers and no student left dry. Yeah. No students left dry. So, <laughs> so, I, so, Thank you for that, for really getting people out into the field. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think I get in trouble because I take the students out of classes on a regular basis and it does pose challenges for them. But we yeah, definitely get a lot of students uh, out <laughs> into the ocean. It is it is definitely uh, something uh, that really has to be done, particularly for graduate students who are going into this field. But I would say also for all the undergraduates, they need to get out on a boat and see the ocean. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, all of that big blue expanse you see around the Hawaiian Islands, most of that is abyssal plain. 
and the average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters. That's 12,000 feet or 2.3 miles. So most of us only get the opportunity to visit the ocean by surfing or fishing or scuba diving. And when we do those activities, which are marvelous, we are visiting but the skin of the ocean. There is exactly. so much more below the couple hundred feet that we can normally interact with. And, and that's that's the portion of the ocean that, that I focus on. And uh, most of your viewers will probably know a little bit of what the deep sea is like. It's very cold, cold water sinks. It's dark, but at least in the top thousand meters, it's not completely dark. Deep sea fishes, as you can see in this picture of a fish at 4,000 meters, it has an eye. There is bioluminescent light. Animals make their own light and they can yep. signal each other that way. And these fishes can actually see sunlight in the middle of the day and clear water all the way down to a thousand meters. Not very well, but their eyes are far better adapted to this environment than, than ours are. And I've always so wondered if they I always wondered if they, you know, how they're affected. I know like some of the corals and, and such when they when there's a full moon cycle and they get a lot more illumination at night and and just that whole story of the vertical migrations that go on in the sea we actually have data that shows that during full moon these animals that migrate up and down in the water column many examples of those are in the the, the picture behind me behind my head um, and they don't come up as as uh, shallow as they would during a new moon and mm -hmm. that shift is only about 50 or maybe 70 meters in depth but yeah, they respond because many of the animals in the deep ocean, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but they migrate daily, as you suggested. And the reason is they don't want to be in surface waters during the day. In the open ocean, there's no place to hide. And if you are a big visible animal, you get taken out by a tuna or a swordfish or, you know, even a diving seabird. Mm -hmm. So most of the smaller animals in the plankton, they dive down to depth during the day and hide out in the dark. But yeah, when there's a full moon, they don't come as shallow at night because they still have to be in the darkness to stay hidden. Yeah, so they sure can't see the light. Yeah, they, they are seeing it. So I would say the other couple of attributes of the deep sea is very high pressure. Every 10 meters you descend into the ocean, you add an atmospheric pressure. And it's a very low food environment in most places because there isn't any light for photosynthesis. So the deep sea is supported by animals coming to the surface periodically, as we just discussed, or uh, there is detritus from all the life in the surface oceans, uh, dead organisms and fecal pellets and things like that that sink into the depths and fuel the food webs in the deep ocean. And cold, dark, high pressure, low food, these are not the kinds of attributes we're accustomed to in, in, uh, in most cases. But I think it's important to realize that because 85% of the living volume is the deep sea, these conditions are actually the normal conditions on Earth. Yeah, it's true. And people don't we're really the odd think, ones. yeah, we're the odd ones out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah with, our, with our warmth and brightly lit environment and all yeah. the rest. 70, 70 degrees and sunny is great for us, but not for these guys. Not for these guys, no. Um, I've talked about the deep sea as a single ecosystem. And... I just have this last point on this slide to emphasize that it is not all the same place. The habitats in the deep sea are extraordinarily varied. There are plains, there are nodule fields. I'll talk about those a little bit later. There are underwater mountains and canyons and trenches, and there are places with incredibly high current speeds and those with very slow current speeds. And it is a there are as many different kinds of habitats in the deep sea as you would find in shallow water. Uh, it's a really big place and there's a lot of variety. Yeah. And, you know, people are still discovering like brand new seamounts and, and the, the tallest mountain in the world is actually in Hawaii, not in the Himalayas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, big island of Hawaii. Yep. Yeah. It's huge. You know, it's just a huge volcano. You know, start at the bottom. That happens start at the bottom. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, start at the abyssal plane and go up from there. Yep. Exactly. So. Oh. This yeah. environment has an amazing diversity of fishes. There are about 5,000 and people argue about what qualifies as a deep sea fish. So I'm not gonna put a hard number on this, but there are something like 5,000 species of fishes that live in the deep sea. 
and more are being discovered. Uh, and there are those that live in the water column, pelagic species. And I've just got a picture here in the top left of a viper fish. Mm -hmm. its teeth, its fangs on its lower jaw are so large that when it closes its mouth, it actually has grooves on the top of its head so that the, those jaws will fit in these grooves wow. in the eye. It's kind of like, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's, its mouth can open almost 180 degrees. So it can Incredible. eat really large prey, Small which is a great cool. strategy in a low food environment, right? Yeah. Whatever you come across, you can eat yeah. it. Whatever fits in your mouth, you can yeah. swallow it. Yeah. <laughs> Bump into something half your size in the dark, you just eat it. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. So uh, here on the right is an angler fish. They're so cool. Oh, they're amazing. Every, everybody, everybody knows about these now. You know, the movie Finding Nemo, when they're when they're looking for Nemo and the, the mask drops into the deep water and they they Marlin and, and Dory go into the deep water, they encounter this angler fish. Now everybody knows what an angler fish is with the lures and the and the big teeth. The lure is this little part I'm putting my cursor on. That's the part that has the little bacterial colony that glows. And this is basically a floating head. <laughs> and stomach. <laughs> has very, very little swimming capacity. This is a great, great picture of one caught off of Hawaii by, by Doug Perrin. On so, the left, we've got an owl fish, and that's from off California. Those eyes are so big, they take up almost the entire head, which wow. illustrates just how important vision is to these fishes in these deep pelagic waters. Mostly, they're looking for bioluminescence. They're, they're trying to find bioluminescent prey. Uh, when large objects move through the deep sea, they disturb plankton, which glows and emits light. So animals can see one another coming probably by all the sparkles in the water column that they create. And down here on the bottom right is a lantern fish. This is a very common group, a very common and diverse group of fishes. Uh, there are actually fisheries developing for some of these things. And That's they amazing. have <laughs> lights on their belly. Yeah. And, uh, and they light up and communicate. The, the patterns of lights on their sides are actually the characters we use to separate different species. So they use these light patterns to communicate with one another. They're species specific. And actually, the male and female fish sometimes, not always, but sometimes have different patterns of photophores as well, special photophores on their tail or on their head that only the males will have, for instance, which are probably used in signaling mates and that kind of thing. It really gets you to the, to the point of wondering, like, you know, how do you, like, get to really study these, these fish? And as Sylvia always says, you know, kind of Jane Goodall has had the experience of being able to go out in the forest and hang out with those same animals day in, day out months at a time, years at a time. And when we go to try to study animals in the deep sea, it's it's just so difficult, you know, to really Especially get- Especially to zero in on individuals, in, not yeah. just species, but that fish that lives in that place. Yeah. That you get it's, to visit for a few minutes. It's hard. Let me show you a slide here really quickly on some of the oh, tools okay. we use so that we can study these animals. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm gonna skip ahead. Oh. But before I get to tools, let me show you some of these videos of the deepest living fish in the world. Yes, because please. That, that's just, so far. I, I love this stuff. We, we started studying the trenches a number of years ago and the fishes that live there. And on the right-hand side, this is the deepest living described fish in the world, Pseudoliparus swirii, and a past graduate student of mine who's now a professor at State University of New York, Mackenzie Geringer, and her colleague, Tom Lindley, um, who's who's at Papa Museum in New Zealand now. They describe this fish. You can see it. This is at a baited camera. So we've placed a chunk of bait out there huh. and uh, attracted all these fish. This actual video comes from 7,500 meters down, but they lived 8,200 meters. So cool. That's deep. And, it's high pressure yeah. and it's cold. Yeah, very oh, cold. Oh yeah, this is, this is barely above a degree centigrade. On the left... This is a much worse quality video. You'll see these tubes sticking into the mud. This is from a task camera on a coring device that was supposed to take sediment cores. And the camera was simply there in the hopes that we could see the instrument performance operation correctly. 
And lo and behold, this fish comes into the field of view. I can't, I, I can't forget the technician who came to me and said, oh, hey, you know, Jeff, there's this fish that swims in the field of view down here at, you know, 8,000 meters. And, and you're like, like what? <laughs> I've never seen this thing before. This is a brand new species of fish. We still have not captured it. So it is not named. We colloquially refer it to as the ethereal snailfish because it's so ghost-like. I mean, beautiful. it's just wisps of of diaphanous fin and tissue. I mean, it's it's an astonishing creature. We've beautiful. seen it a couple times since, but we still have yet to actually capture one. So wow. we don't know who this is. Yep. And that's oh, and... that's working in the deep sea. Here it comes again. There's a bit of a cut there in the time sequence, but you get this all those little sort of. The feelers down underneath too. The yeah. most sensing organism, sensing like that, Yeah, and in that video, you'll you know you'll see it um, try to take a snap at something uh, on the on the sea surface. So yeah, those fins are just armed with chemosensory structures, basically taste buds, mm. and also uh, little tactile sensors. So if anything moves or brushes up against it, it can sense it. And right there, boom, it just grabs yeah. something. <laughs> or tried to grab something. We have no idea if it was successful. Wouldn't you love to know what it feels, what it senses? I mean, we oh. just can only imagine what it's like to be one. Yeah, it's incredible. But it's just another example of how, yeah, these fish have eyes, but they use so many other of their senses in in the in the deep sea. It just yeah. makes sense. Light's not the predominant sensory cue any longer it's just one of a number of sensory cues it's and just... they're curious look at that i mean oh, sorry <laughs> it's our job to go out and and explore and see these things and they they're as curious as we are in a way they what is this new thing landed here yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go alien spaceship yeah <laughs> yeah indeed so yeah. So these are the world's deepest living fishes. They live, they, fishes live in, in all the world's oceans, except the very, very deepest couple thousand meters. And that so, we know of. <laughs> that we know of. Although we have some physiological reasons to believe they will not be found deeper. Um, I, I know, that's what the book out. says. But... <laughs> Nature always surprises us, right? It does. Yeah. 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 That's so cool. Yeah. So some of the tools that we use to study these animals uh, are quite simply to capture things, traps and baited hooks. This is me and my graduate advisor, Ken Smith, hauling a what amounts to a big lobster pot back up on deck, and it's got some rat tail fishes in there. And, you know, this is my newfangled trap, which has uh, managed to catch me. Uh, <laughs> I was going to... Trap. Is there anyway that was you or or you know like one of the graduate students to kind of messed that's, up? That's me crawling in there. Um, <laughs> is that bait? <laughs> <laughs> I think some of my graduate students wanted it to be bait. Um, and we also use baited cameras. So if I can get this to play here, this is from off of Hawaii, about a thousand meters. Those are cutthroat eels. There's a rat tail in the background. And this was some video we collected with folks at National Geographic. This is a false cat shark right here. And uh, baited cameras are a great way to survey fishes in the deep sea because many of them are mobile. Many of them get scared away by larger pieces of instrumentation moving through the water, like a submarine or something like that. And so if you put down a piece of bait, not all of them, but a number of them will be attracted to that in a food poor environment. And so they show up right in front of your, your sampling device, your camera. That's cool. It can work really well. So I showed you that here and then with the snailfish uh, in the trench. And, you know, we also use just uh, nets and, and, and trawls. And uh, this is a video of what's called the mock ness, the multiple opening mock closing nets. net environmental <laughs> sampling system, which is a giant mouthful. And you can see this thing being deployed in the water and you just drag it behind the ship and all those white buckets at the end, they're the end of each net. 
and all of the sample goes into those buckets. So when you pull it back on deck, like you're seeing done right now, then you end up with uh, buckets full of animals, including fishes. And this is a sample trawl catch down here. And all those dark things are fish and all wow. the red things are jellies or shrimps. And there's a whole lot of, of other organisms in there too that uh, you can't see. There's some krill and, and some shrimps that are transparent and some eel larvae that are transparent, uh, jellies, things like that. So, Jeff, yeah. imagine if you, if you were trying from high in the sky, you'd never seen Africa before, and you used standard oceanographic techniques like this. You dragged it across the savanna and you wound up with a bunch of crushed animals, you'd have no idea who they are, how they live. You kind of look at their dead bodies, which is what you're looking at here. But who would care about elephants if you only saw their dead bodies? Oh, absolutely. Well, or honey badger. Honey badger. <laughs> There's two things or that your comment brings up. One is you need to see the animals behaving in their environment. Absolutely. The, this is very hard, and I'm getting to this in a minute with a different tool. Subs and ROVs are great tools for this. And the beta cameras work too, but it's a little artificial because you put food out in front of them. Yeah. But the other part of it is, would you ever even catch an elephant in a net? No. You'd probably catch insects and lizards and the small stuff. You'd catch the slow stuff. So... Yeah. Nets have the bias. I always tell my students this. They catch the slow and the dumb. You know, there, there are things that don't manage to get out of the way or can't get out of the way of the net. Very active fishes, squids, they just move. Yeah, they get out of town. These nets work well for things that are usually less than six inches long or so, maybe 10 centimeters, something like that. But a lot of them are squishy. Yeah, and the squishy stuff nets are terrible for because everything just oozes right through the mesh of the net. Yeah, that's where your, buck, your buckets at the end probably help a little bit with that because it's kind of catches them in the water, but still. Yeah, but it's it's much better to sample jellies and bigger things with other sampling tools. The Absolutely. bigger things, those beta cameras are great because they attract the bigger things. And uh, as we're going to see in a minute, the ROVs and and uh, other sort of observation platforms like subs, they're great for, for looking at behaviors and figuring out how the animals are interacting with their environment. But before I get to that, another tool that my past graduate student, Jesse Perelman, would uh, definitely want me to be covering is bioacoustics. And here you have typically a shipboard platform. This is a sail drone. This is an autonomous vessel. Yeah, they're our next door neighbors. <laughs> yeah, and, and these things are great. Sail drone is just awesome. And it's it's a fish finder. It's like sonar. You send a sound pulse down, which is illustrated by these green arcs. And when it encounters organisms in the water column, the sound is reflected off of those animals. And then it bounces back and you receive it. And you create what's called an echogram, which you can see in the figure below. And the Bright colors are more biomass in the water column, more reflection of sound anyway. And you can see, for instance, at night, most of the biomass is up near the surface. And then during the day, many of those animals descend to depth and they're hanging out at 200 down to four or five, 600 meters during the day in this particular uh, echogram. And oftentimes you see these layers extend all the way down to a thousand meters or so during the day. And frequently you see layers of animals that don't move day to night. They huh. stay in the same place. But it's a really useful tool to at least get an idea of where the animals are in their environment. Um, but with bioacoustics, you can't actually see what you're reflecting sound off of. So there's right. a lot of work involved there. Yeah. So, you know, none of these tools is really used in isolation. It's best when you have multiple tools to bring. Yeah, we, we love to see people go to see with that full toolbox approach. Yeah, definitely. So um, that brings me to submarines and remotely operated vehicles. And subs are fantastic. And we've been diving using submarines and human occupied vehicles uh, for, for many, many decades now. And it goes back to William Beebe's uh, bathysphere 
mm-hmm. which wasn't a submarine and that it wasn't self-propelled, but it was certainly a human occupied vehicle. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can look out the window, you have to turn the lights on in the deep sea, but you can look out the window and you can actually see the animals as they are in their natural environment. And, and you can uh, drive about, you can count these animals to survey for densities, you can observe behaviors, that sort of thing. Uh, and so they're really a useful tool. I think probably more common today are remotely operated vehicles uh, or ROVs. And I'm showing a picture here on the right of, of UH's uh, vehicle, the Lukai. Uh-huh. And the ROV is actually this portion on the bottom, starting with the orange flotation. And just like subs, they're they have lights and usually sample boxes and robotic arms, and you can do many of the same kinds of things. Um, the difference is that you sit in a control room like what this video is showing aboard the ship, and you have lots of computer screens with all the feeds from the various cameras on your ROV, and you're driving everything from topside. And that has its advantages and disadvantages. Advantages? The bathroom's just down the hallway. That's you right. <laughs> um, the, and, and arguably safer, although I think all of the scientific submarines are have been very, very safe and have great, exactly. great safety records. Yep. Liz has her fingerprints all over this particular ROV. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yes. Yeah. And it helped with the construction of it. And that one goes to 6,500 or so. That's its step three eighty exactly. but. 7,000. But most of the most of the work that it's been doing is, you know, kind of right in that key zone of kind of 4,000, 5,000 meter range. Yep. Yeah. So we worked a fair bit with the Lukai yeah. and it's, it's a really great platform. And everything in between. Everything in between. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I would be remiss if I did not say submarines definitely have their place. They are fantastic in super rough terrain because you don't have to worry about that cable above exactly. you, you to the ship which could get yeah. snagged on things. Yep. And uh, you're independent of the ship's motion in its entirety. So if you're in a seamount and there's currents going one way at depth and there's wind blowing the ship another way at the surface, you know, that can pose challenges to, to keeping ROVs really on, on their point uh, underwater. So subs do have a place still. Yeah, they're very, very complementary tools. And, you mm-hmm. know, and I, and I really love the, the opportunities we've had to use the the Pisces submersibles over there, particularly, I mean, they did in their career, they did so much history, you know, so many historic dives and, and really working in pairs. So you could kind of light an area in one way and, and observe from the other way. And, you know, they're just a, a yeah. amazing tools to have available. You need a full toolbox. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You, you really do. Yeah. So yeah, those those are some of the tools that that I've used, and it's not all of them, but it's a bunch of them anyway. Um, and yeah, it's uh, you need the whole toolbox to to really paint a comprehensive picture of what the deep sea is like. Yeah, not just what's there, but what do they do, and how do they interact with their environment with each other, and you know, to to get everything. What are some of the more surprising uh, behaviors that you observed from the deep sea fishes? Oh, you know, all kinds of interesting things. Um, we're in the I'm deep show sea. You in a few yeah, bits. we're in the deep sea here. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you a video of a, of a big six gill shark in, in a couple of slides here, but uh, some other really interesting behaviors. Um, it's uh, fascinating to see these, these giant demersal um, angler fishes, Sladenia in Hawaii, and they'll sit perched on the highest boulder around oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes. And they're just sitting there like the angler fish we described a little a few slides ago, you know, just a little bit ago. But they don't, um, but they, they, uh, they're really targeting some larger uh, benthic fish and, uh, and they just, they look like the king of the hill, you know, they're sitting. <laughs> little like, attitude. Yeah, they really do. Uh, and I, I remember the first time I saw one of these things and I made them stop in the sub. We were right in the middle of a transect because I'd never seen one before. And it feels <laughs> fascinating. Um, oh, there's just, there's so many cool behaviors. Um, we had a, a little eel pout, which is a little eel-like fish, um, yay long. 
that decided to take up residence in the structure of the Aloha Cabled Observatory, which is oh, a cool. permanent installment at 4,700 meters north of the island of Oahu. And we watched this thing for days as it just sort of camped out on part of the of the of the frame of of this cabled observatory. Um, would go in and out from under this little sign, excavated a little bit of mud, made itself a little house. Um, just I don't know. There's 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 lots of of really interesting things to see. They they always they always amaze. So. I guess a main point I wanted to bring to your viewers today is that the deep sea is the last frontier on the planet. And to put a bit of a fine point on that, I think sometimes people will see the statement online, the surface of the moon is better mapped than the bottom of the ocean. That is actually true. There's a huge project called Seabed 2030, which hopes to provide at least 50 meter uh, grid resolution. I think it's 50 meter for the entire world by 2030. I don't know if we're going to make it, but we're trying really hard to actually map the bottom of the seafloor. We were surveying seamounts in the clarion Clipperton zone back in 2018, and we were comparing the faunas on underwater mountains to abyssal plains, and we had picked out different seamounts, and we went to one of them. We were using the maps available. And that oftentimes includes maps that you would see on Google Earth. They're based on satellite altimetry. They are not actually based on seafloor mapping. And our seamount did not exist. It was <laughs> not there. Well, wow. So there, there are problems with our maps. And so this first statement I've, I've put here, it's true. And, yeah. But we're getting better. And we, we hope to have the bottom of the ocean mapped in, at least in the next couple of decades. Uh, it's been estimated that there are a million new species waiting to be discovered in the deep sea, and there is one estimate that suggests it's even more than that. Yeah. And here's just a couple of new species that we have found here in Hawaii. Uh, on the top is a king crab. The head of that crab is about the size of my fist. Wow. And so this is not a small, innocuous little thing. And we caught this basically offshore of the city of Honolulu. At 1500, <laughs> that's only you know, that's just a few miles offshore, yeah. In a populous place that's had deep sea investigators for decades, and we're still finding new things like this. The well, bottom well, one is uh, a snailfish, so it's related to those trench snailfish I showed earlier. And uh, this was the first of this family in, in Hawaiian waters, so Paralipleris hawaiiensis. Very so good. it's, you know, there's a lot of new stuff. A lot of it is small, but there are still things like fishes being discovered and described all the time. One of my past students has just described a new species of anglerfish uh, from the Clarion Clipperton mining zone. So, yeah, yeah, one of your colleagues, Richard Pyle, he uses rebreathers, another tool in the box, to go down to 100 meters or so, right to the top of the this twilight zone, but um, sometimes a dozen new species per hour because nobody has actually had the privilege until right about now to get down into this least explored part of the planet. So bravo, Jeff, for doing what you're doing, shining a light on not just what's known, but what we don't know. You always say that the deeper we go, the less we know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the more new things. But the more new things yeah, we're, we're finding, finding all the time. Yeah. 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 And my last point here, you know, with all this this uh, discovery being made, is that I think we're still trying to understand how our human society is affecting the deep sea. Yeah. And I think we've got a much better handle on that in shallow water, but the connections to the deep sea are still less described. And, and so, you know, part of the reason why I'm here talking to you all today is that I think for the vast majority of people, the deep sea is out of sight. They haven't been able to go there or they haven't seen one of the wonderful nature specials illustrating the deep sea. And so it's out of their minds and they don't think about it. Even if they think about the oceans, many people don't think about the deep ocean. And so sure, they might they might get to go out and snorkel or dive on a reef or right. um, they're out sailing or whatnot, but 
but you really start to think about the you know the whole volume of of the water and yeah the life that's in the water yeah, yeah. Mm. and it, you know it's not anybody's fault it's no, just not at all snorkel in the deep sea so i i feel it's incumbent upon me as a deep sea scientist to talk about the deep sea and share the stuff that i'm so privileged to get to view and, and get to experience because that's the only way we we uh we can get uh people generally to know about this place so and here yeah yeah that's why we have this this program so we really love the opportunity to you know share these stories and get people to think about like What's going on in the ocean? Oh, is this the six school? Hey, let's see. Let's see this guy. Okay. So I got to tell a story before I show you the video. So this is part of a set of experiments that we were doing off of the north side of the island of Molokai and Hawaiian island chain. And we are sitting in the Pisces submersible at a thousand meters. And it's myself and my colleague, Eric Vetter, who is at Hawaii Pacific University and Max Kramer. <laughs> who is now the the head of uh, the ROV group, um, or or was until recently. Uh, he's the pilot, good friend of mine, and um, we were surveying the organisms that live in submarine canyons in the Hawaiian Islands, and we were doing this by driving subtransects across the seafloor and counting all the various fishes and other animals that we observed. And there were lots of fishes. It was great, really fun dives. But the problem is that sub is big and noisy. So some fishes are scared away and they don't show up if you just drive across the seafloor. Bright lights, they run away. So we were also putting out a chunk of bait on the seafloor, kind of like those baited camera experiments we were talking about earlier. And we turn all the lights off on the sub and just park on the seafloor for a few minutes. And then every five minutes, we'd turn the lights on for a minute or two, count everything we'd see, we could see out the portholes and record with the video. And then we'd turn the lights off again. And we'd, we'd do that a couple of times. And so we're sitting there at one of these stations, parked on the seafloor at 1,000 meters, having our lunch, because it's about noon, and the lights are off, and there's just instrument light inside the submarine, and there's basically no light except a little dim light coming out of our portholes outside the sub. But it felt to me like the sub was moving. And so yeah. I asked Max, and I'm like, what's what's going on? I I, I, I kind of get the sense we're moving. And he looks at his gauges and like, no, no, we're not moving. So I peer out of my little tiny porthole, which is which is tiny, and press my face up against it, and I'm can see just a little bit from the light coming out of the other portholes. There's three in total. And I could have sworn I saw something moving out there, but it was really kind of shadowy and indistinct because it was so dimly lit. We looked at the clock, and I think there was like a minute left before we were supposed to turn off on the lights. And I asked Eric, I'm like, can we just turn the lights on now? I think there's something out there. And uh, Eric was like, sure, let's let's turn on the lights. And and this is what we saw. Oh, my God. Yeah, we got moved. It's oh. a gigantic exangus. Wow. Can you hear the audio? Is the audio coming through for yeah. you? Yeah. It's a submarine. <laughs> Things go bump in the dark. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. What a beautiful fish. Oh, what an elegant creature. Isn't that amazing? That is a six gill shark. It is 16 feet long. Oh, yeah. Whoa. You're not going to catch that on a plankton net. No, you certainly are not. But I, you know, it was an amazing moment being in a submarine, seeing this incredible animal, and that sense of motion that I had felt after the cloud of mud cleared, we saw skid marks of the sub. <laughs> the shark had basically pushed us back across the seafloor uh, a few feet, trying to find the bait. It was nosing around, you know, now the smell was overpowering and was everywhere, yeah. and it wasn't quite sure where the food was. And so it kind of bumped into us and moved us backwards, keeping in mind that the sub is close to neutrally buoyant at depth. It doesn't weigh yeah. a lot underwater. Yeah, yeah, it kind of moves about, but, but and, still um, so awesome. Yeah, we saw these sharks on virtually every dive we did between about 500 and 1,000 meters. Now, if you think about what we know of shallow water sharks in Hawaii, if I ask a grade school class what a tiger shark is, 
everybody knows what that shark is. This is the shallow water shark that's so frequent in big shark that's frequent in our shallow coral systems. And they occasionally do bite people, but they're, you know, they're glorious top predators. But you ask anybody what a six gill shark is, and they'll just give you they're this. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. And it's just another mile offshore, a few hundred meters down. Yeah. But it's emblematic of how little we know about the deep sea. These animals in Hawaii, we barely know what they eat. We don't, we have a little bit of data on where they move. We don't know where their young are because we seem to only see adults. We don't know anything about their reproduction here. We don't know how many of them there are. We have all that information for tiger sharks. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's just sort of a contrast and, 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 a, and a, there's, there's a lot we have yet to do in the deep sea. Even these big animals, while we know what they are, we know little about what they're doing down there. Yeah. Um, they're really common. They're just as common as tiger sharks. You know, and as we're kind of creeping up on the 45 minute mark, um, you know, I thought we should talk a little bit about, you know, some of the impacts that activities in the deep sea are having on, you know, on these marine animal, you know, on these deep sea fishes and the whole ecosystem. Um, you know, particularly the, the threat of the mining, the deep sea mining. So shall I move straight to deep sea mining then? Well, I think we, you know, we might want to do a whole another visit with you on that as well. But, <laughs> but know, we should, we but must. we should, you know, you know, it's also just timely to mention it, I think, because okay. to your point, there's so, there's so much there that we don't know. And it just seems that it's a, a good time for at least a Well, we're burning the pause. books before we've even read them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But well, but let's talk about how how are we connected to the deep sea fishes? Yeah. Well, I'm going to do this really quickly because I want to get to the deep sea mining. So you're 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 giving me. And we a, have to have a few question time. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you're like me, you find these fishes amazing just because of their diversity and their adaptations and their importance to the ecosystem. But I think it's important to impress upon people that despite the fact the deep sea is out of mind, we are actually connected to it just in ways we typically aren't aware of. And so we gather all kinds of natural products from deep sea organisms. There are cancer and arthritis drugs coming from deep sea corals, like the ones pictured in the bottom right. We actually have an enzyme that breaks down fats in your laundry detergent that comes from microbes that were farmed from deep sea whale bones. Wow. So natural products. The other thing is we actually fish the deep sea regularly down to a depth of about 1500 meters, depending on where in the world you are. And so I've picked a few commercially harvested species here. But do you this think is the rat tail, which you can never market in the fish market. So they renamed those grenadiers. Oh, um, I've but, seen but, those for but, sale yeah. in California. Do, do you think we should? Well, no, this fish <laughs> is 70 years old. Thank you. And yeah. Most demersal deep sea fisheries are waning and yeah. the global fish catch, only about a half a percent of it is made up of deep sea species anymore. Um, largely because we had a series of boom and bust fisheries where these fish are quite slow metabolism, slow growth, long lived, and those fisheries turned out to be unsustainable. So hopefully we won't come back and over the next several decades, these stocks will recover. Well, hopefully we'll get but, some protection for the high seas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would suggest avoiding most of these fish, like the, the rat tails or grenadiers, thorny heads. The moon Although, fish. Oh, yeah. God, they're so beautiful. Opa on the right is a deep sea fish from Hawaii. Um, I don't personally know what the stock assessment status for the species is, but it's a water column dweller and it does grow much more quickly than the two species on the left. So I think there's- what is, their, what is their role in maintaining the health of these ecosystems when you don't even have an understanding of what, of what the system, how it normally functions and how that relates to climate, how that relates to, to the chemistry of the ocean? Mm -hmm. how it relates to the, the carbon cycle, for example, or the nutrient cycles. And, and we're just blindly bulldozing life out of the ocean by the ton. 
and and we don't even have names for some of the creatures that are now being taken and marketed. It, it, it's just to me unfathomable that we would consider taking these fish when it's it's again I think about wildlife on the land. We don't do this to songbirds and just sweep them out of their sky and grind them up and <laughs> feed them to chickens. Yeah, <laughs> right. But we do that with the fish. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All these three species are sold as filet. So yeah, so you have no idea, you know, what you're really getting. But, but Sylvia, the smaller fishes, like those lantern fishes, yes, that's the goal is to grind them into fish meal and feed them to chickens and to ah. them like that. Infuriating. Yeah. But here, Those you fisheries don't... may not take off. There's a lot of debate as to what's going on there. Yeah, I hope they never do, and we can get some enduring protection for the high seas to, for the fish and yeah, in the mining too. Carbon sequestration. There you go. That's yeah. It. So this is to address your idea of connectivity. The large oceanic fishes on the right are the things we like to eat, like tuna and opa and swordfish. And this is a food web. And the top of the figure shows the surface ocean and the bottom, the deep midwaters. And what's really important is that all of these animals in the middle of the food web, the small fishes and squids and the plankton, they're, they're going up and down in the water column. And when they do that, they take carbon from feeding in surface waters, they move to depth and they breathe and they poop. They're moving that carbon. They're part of this biological carbon pump that helps draw carbon dioxide, this greenhouse gas, out yeah. of our atmosphere and into the deep ocean. So they're a very important part of that. We're recognizing that movement of animals is incredibly important to this biological carbon pump. Yeah. The other part to note of this figure is that these things we don't even often associate as being deep sea, like tuna, many species, not all of them, but many dive to great depths and they feed in the deep sea. Swordfish dive to 1,200 meters. I already showed you the opa diving to 1,000, big eye tuna, 600 meters, uh, bluefin tuna, 1,000 meters. They yeah. feed the animals. So I love this graphic right here. The next time you sit down to a bowl of poke or a plate of sashimi, remember you are one step in the food web removed from crazy animals like this viper fish over here on the left. <laughs> right. So you're connected to the deep sea, even if perhaps you haven't seen a lot of it and, and you don't think about it very often. Absolutely. So society is connected. So this brings us to how our activities are affecting the deep sea. And we've already talked a little bit about fishing, but I wanted to focus just for the couple of left minutes we have left on deep sea mining, because I think this is a anthropogenic uh, risk that many people aren't super well acquainted with. I know you have already talked about deep sea mining on this show before, but um, they're after metal deposits in the deep sea. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk very much about these. Uh, Next episode, we'll get you back. <laughs> yeah, but they're they're after mostly these these nodule structures, and I'm going to hold one up right here in front of me. This comes from the abyssal seafloor, and they form over millions of years, and they contain cobalt, copper, manganese, and nickel, and those are battery metals. And if we want to move away from fossil fuels and embark on a green transition to renewable energy sources, we have to store that energy and we need batteries to do that. Currently, those lithium ion batteries that are needed for energy storage, at least in the transportation sector for cars, um, those lithium ion batteries use these metals. And so that's largely uh, what's driving this, this pursuit of, of mining on the deep sea floor, which has not begun yet. Thankfully. <laughs> Industries are testing their collector vehicles right now, and they would like it to begin on the high seas. The International Seabed Authority hopes to approve its exploitation regulations by 2025, about a year and a half from now. So, Meanwhile, battery technology is going fast forward without the use of these metals. That's without true. Without nickel, without cobalt. And a lot yeah. of the a lot of the big manufacturers have already said that they don't want any uh, metals from the deep sea in their supply chains, which is, you know, encouraging. really encouraging. 
but yeah. look at this the area that's that's in the crosshairs this is this is what grabbed my attention when i was first introduced to this subject over 10 years ago was the scale yeah all terrestrial mining covers a land area of about 60,000 square kilometers but if you take a look at just the licenses to mine these nodules on the abyssal plain in what's called the clarion clipperton zone which is between hawaii and central america there's 18 or 19 licenses some of them represent more than one of these polygons but Altogether, there's 30 globally, and it's one and a half million square kilometers. Wow. License for exploration. Nobody's been given a permit to actually mine yet, but exploration. One and a half million square kilometers compared to 60,000 square kilometers in terrestrial mining today. That's it's insane. huge. You superimpose all these areas onto a map of the continental United States. You can see that it stretches from California to Pennsylvania. It's massive. Massive. Wow. Well, I think we should we should probably jump over to a couple of questions while we have a few minutes left. But you must right. you must promise you'll come back, Jeff. <laughs> I can some... come back and talk more about deep sea mining if you like. And fish in the sure. new year, we'll do that. Absolutely. Excellent. Because there's so much about what you know and should be sharing about the nature of the creatures, our fellow vertebrates. <laughs> with a very long history that shaped the, and still shapes the nature of the planet that that I think we need to articulate, you need to share. With. And on top of that, the deep sea mining that threats, threatens really the habitability of the ocean and therefore of the planet. I mean, it's just really urgent that we hear hear you loud and clear he'll be back can you uh, stop the screen sharing so we people can see us absolutely bigger yay thank you <laughs> all right our first question um what skills certifications or textbook field guides would you suggest for undergraduate student researchers uh, wanting to pursue a career in this field yeah so basically you need all those general lab skills that you may be acquiring as an undergraduate student, uh, just basic biology and ecology uh, to go into this field. Get involved in research, do some research. To, you know, it's probably not going to be in the deep sea. There aren't many of us deep sea folks around, but study shallow water ecology and, uh, and learn those kinds of skills because they're all going to be transportable into the deep water realm. And as far as textbooks go, um, we're in the midst of writing a new textbook on deep sea ecology, but Excellent. Uh, yeah, the last one was published in the late nineties. So it's, oh my Lord. Yeah. It's, it's time. time. Overdue. <laughs> yep. Okay. Stephanie is asking, do any of you have well, good book recommendations for kids about deep sea fish? I want to try to teach my granddaughter about the ocean as much as possible. There is a new book called Deep, Deep Down. I don't know what age category you're talking about, but this is sort of a elementary school book and it's about life in the trenches and includes the those deep water snailfish uh, that I talked about, the author right Lydia Lutakis. And, deep, deep uh, down, all right. Yeah. Um, there's a few others. There's also a deep sea coloring book that you might be able to find on Amazon, but it may be yeah. out of print now. I don't know. That sounds like a, that sounds like it's worthy of a reprint. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Gail is asking: Do the deep sea fish need less O2 than we do? They do, but actually, this is a very complicated answer. So, <laughs> the animals are inhabiting colder temperatures, and they are cold blooded. So the colder you are, the less oxygen you need because your metabolism is moving slower. But there's also this other really interesting situation with fishes in that their metabolism declines to even lower levels than you would predict just by temperature. Hmm. Um, as, you as you descend into the, into the ocean, it gets darker and darker. 
And that means the distances over which a predator can detect and chase down a prey actively, or that prey can see a predator far off and run away, those distances shrink because you can't see each other over as long a space. Wow. And so the animals don't put a lot of energy into heavy muscle masses, which, you know, it's like a race car. Your race car is burning gasoline, even if it's just running idle in the driveway and a whole lot more than, you know, your, uh, your Toyota Camry or whatever, your yeah. small economy car. So, um, you know, they, they, they have low metabolisms for that reason. I mean, think about this angler fish over, over my shoulder right here. That's this guy. <laughs> That's so adorable. <laughs> that can't live in the shallow surface ocean. It would be spotted tens of meters away by some predator and go get gobbled up. Yeah, that can live at a thousand meters in the deep sea, but it has a very low metabolic rate, so not much oxygen consumption. Okay, um, Gene is asking, what sets the limits for how deep fishes can live? Okay, so this has to do with pressure adaptations. So many organisms uh, have a host of different kinds of pressure adaptations. And one of the ones we found is very important in trench animals. And this was really led by Paul Yancey. He's a professor retired now at Whitman College. And there are these little molecules that stabilize proteins under increasing pressure. So those proteins, like an enzyme, can still function at depth. But if you add lots of these little tiny molecules into your tissues, they increase the os osmotic potential, the saltiness of the tissues. And basically these fishes accumulate so much of this that by the time they get to 8,200 meters, they become equal in their osmotic potential, their saltiness to seawater. And they haven't yet evolved a way to be saltier than seawater. <laughs> so that's it. That's oh, their thing. That's what wow. sets that's very cool. But they've been around for 300, 400 million years. Do you think there might be some clever physiologically adapted creature that we have yet to discover? I mean, super I, I, salty creature, super salty. Yeah. <laughs> so what's interesting is not fishes, because we think that most of the current groups of fishes that live in those depths they invaded after the last big anoxic event in the deep sea about 100 million years ago. So their evolutionary history is not as long in under these kinds of conditions. They haven't had as much time as, they, as, as animals elsewhere might have. But we can look at invertebrates and little amphipods, which are a shrimp-like crustacean, they use a different pressure stabilizing molecule. The one the fishes use is called trimethylamine oxide, but the these invertebrates, they use what's called silo in acetal, and it seems to be much more effective at lower concentrations than the osmolite that the fish use. So maybe at some point fishes will evolve these other osmolites, these other pressure stabilizing molecules, and they will be able to extend deeper. Well, sea cucumbers must- They as well, yes. Yeah, have developed the trick. I'll bet, yeah. 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 There's a, there's a host of, of other organisms um, down there, but it's really interesting. You see large clades of animals drop out as you descend into the trench depths. There's not a lot of habitat area. That's and so true. there may not be a huge evolutionary pressure, but lots of different animals have independently evolved the pressure adaptations required to live down there. Sea cucumbers and amphipods being two good examples. Herbary chinoderms. Yeah. yeah. And squids, perhaps certain, certain we, mollusks. Yeah. Uh, other mollusks. Squids we haven't seen deeper than, I think, about 8,000 meters. Shrimp drop out at 7,000 meters, but they're crustaceans, and the amphipods have made it all the way to 11,000 meters. So, right you, you amphipods, know, yeah. Yeah, so it gets interesting. Um, but, yeah. but I it, hope that answers the question. Really, thank you. Should drive us to want to know. We want We've to got know. to get down there. We want to know. We are. We remain curious. That's key. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're a little past the top of the hour, so oh. we, I'll be scolded if I go too long. So. <laughs> 
Thank you, Jeff. Um, before we close today, again, thank you so much. Thank you to the ocean elders and to all the ocean community who shows up and dives in with us and participates in these discussions and conversations. Water connects us all and we're incredibly grateful to everyone. We're going to be back in December with three episodes, um, kind of stacked up towards the end of the month. So watch for those announcements. And until then, take care of the ocean as if your life depends on it. Because it does. Because it does. Yeah. Thank you again, Jeff. And we will bring you back in the new year. Yes, please. Thanks again for having me. It was a great conversation. Absolutely. Deeply. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.